Right, okay, so um, internet broadcasting, HTTP live streaming. So the first thing to note is that this isn't about Coco, so sorry about that. I'll, uh, but it is a bit Apple-ish, because it's an Apple technology. So a bit of background. Um, this is a project that's trying to help community radio, and there's a long and varied history about this, but basically lots of stations broadcast in FM and AM. They're rolling out DAB, you know, digital radio, um, but only 30 metropolitan stations get access to this, and there's no bandwidth on the digital audio radio spectrum for any more. And even then, you can only really receive it where you can receive that particular digital signal. So internet streaming would seem like a, a logical way of broadcasting things these days, but there's no sector-wide program to try and deal with this. And the only stations that can do it are the ones that can afford to do it. And so a lot of small stations are left out and they don't, they, they, you know, we're talking like small community stations up in the Northern Territory and such like, they don't have the cash or the skills to be able to deliver internet radio. <laughs> Also, FM, AM, and DAB, they all require special hardware. So even, you know, uh, I don't know, our, our thinking is that digital radio is kind of a nice idea, but everyone's got a phone in their pocket with internet access, and they've got a desktop which has internet access, and their TV has internet access, and like fridges and washing machines, whatnot. So, you know, internet streaming is actually becoming a more pervasive way of accessing uh, this content than perhaps even FM and AM these days. So we're Emit Media, I say we, I mean there's no one else here, but my um, cohort Jürgen, who's uh, currently at some media party drinking free <laughs> beer, uh, <laughs> he's the media side. Um, so we're a startup, but we, we actually have a little bit of revenue, so it's not quite covering costs, but people are actually paying for the service at the moment. And we want to build a scalable, modern internet broadcast solution for community stations, but also going forward, potentially other people as well. So originally this came out of a project at PBS Radio, and um, now we're doing some work with Triple R as well, and we've got other stations, 3MBS, 2FBI, 4ZZZ, 4EB, and all these kinds of guys. They're gradually rolling out, so we've got seven going on, ten stations using it at the moment. And we've had version one running for a few years, but we had problems. The thing is, streaming's hard to solve, and like, traditionally, you'd end up with things like RTSP, Flashcom server, and all this kind of stuff, and they're quite expensive, because the smarts are on the server. So when you want to scale it out, you need more hardware, you need bigger bandwidth, and all that kind of stuff. And we have no money, and uh, neither do the clients. So if we can absorb the costs by doing a little bit of work in the evenings, you know, our own time, that's great because there's no ongoing costs, well, minimal ongoing costs. And there are existing solutions out there, but they tend not to cater for the continual stream. So when you're thinking of something like a TV channel or a, a radio show, there's no beginning and end. It's just continuous, live, all the time. And a lot of streaming solutions are about delivering uh, finite length material. So whether that be, you know, a keynote event or a, you know, even a video like this one will be or something. Um, and there's lots of devices and lots of codecs and finding something that works on everything is tricky. So the way we approach solving this was, all right, so what's the most pervasive codex? MP3. And AAC. Now, MP3 probably has wider support, but AAC is far superior in terms of sound quality and a particular bitrate. And we picked one streaming technology, which is HLS, which I'll get to in a minute. In terms of the actual back-end platform, we designed everything for failure. Small, uh, repeatable chunks of work, you know, the system can fall over sideways and minimal impacts had. Um, and we want to scale out rather than scaling up. So rather than just adding bigger and bigger hardware, we just add more and more machines to the cluster. So this is much more of an architectural um, architectural strategy, I suppose, rather than just uh, throwing money at the problem. 
So the stack that we're using, yeah, Ruby, Sinatra, Rescue, Redis. Uh, lots of RESTful APIs and all the front ends are just static content, so super simple. Everything's just hosted as much as possible in S3 with CloudFront in front of it. We're using Elasticsearch for like our big data-y type stuff and MySQL, which is an RDS, which is an Amazon service, which basically takes care of the pain of scaling MySQL. So thumbs up. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, uh, I can't be asked. You know, if Amazon solve it, I'm happy to use that. Um, the main cluster at the moment is three C1 mediums, which are basically a high CPU. I think in Amazon's terms, they're five ECUs, which is um, it's a fairly beefy machine, so lots of FFmpeg processes running on there. So HLS, Apple's HTTP live streaming. So it's really cool because you can think of it a little bit like it's RESTful streaming, or it's streaming for the RESTful generation, I suppose. So, and by that I kind of mean it uses HTTP. It doesn't fight against it. it it's, um, it's going back to the principles of what HTTP is about and trying not to do too much on top of it. So how does it work? So you get your input audio stream. The thing will chop up that audio stream into small sections of music or whatever it may be and it uploads it onto a CDN. And as it does that, it generates a playlist file, which is just a text file, which is just a list of entries of each of these segments. And all this stuff is pushed onto your CDN. So the clients just pull that playlist and find new parts. And when they see new parts, they just attach that seamlessly to the part before and play it back. I've got a diagram here. So this bit over here, yeah, okay, so audio goes in, gets chopped up, gets uploaded, client receives it. But this distribution part over here, it's all just flat files. All that's S3. We're totally not involved in that aspect of it. It can scale arbitrarily because as long as Amazon's capacity is not maxed out, clients will be able to access it. So what we do is this bit over this side where we take the input audio or video stream, we transcode it, and we segment it. So the implication here is the server's dumb. And if it's dumb, it's cheap. And the server's stateless as well, which means it's scalable. And this is great for iOS. Here's my little hook back into the iOS side of things, and OS X, of course. But Apple do have requirements. If you're going to put an app out there where you're streaming content to it, you have to be able to provide a 3G-friendly, audio-only version. So you know, you've got to hate, and they prefer HLS. So you know, this is quite an easy way of doing that. And obviously all the Apple tools support HLS out of the box, as far as I know. I'm looking at Oliver. Um, <laughs> and you also have a higher level playlist which references the other playlist. So you can basically have a meta playlist which says, here's all the playlists with all the different bit rates and codecs you have. And you basically pass that onto the client and the client chooses the best one. If it can't keep up with the um, the bit rate, it will drop to the next bit rate down and intelligently scale up and down. <coughs> and you know, it's just HTTP, so you can just use this with uh, you know proxies, firewalls, front end caches, all of that stuff. It plays nicely. There's no fancy stuff going on. So the under other benefits are that it's just because it's all just S3 and CloudFront, clients just interact with Amazon. They don't interact with us. So we're totally out of the picture. And we because of that, we scale according to how many broadcasters we have, not how many receivers there are. It's fairly fault tolerant. Even if the system goes down, those files are still there in uh, S3, CloudFront. So you know, the worst case scenario, something doesn't happen for a couple of minutes, those playlists are still live. Yeah, so you can do like PVR style stuff where you can pause live streams, you can rewind. Event streaming like the Apple Keynote, you know, it'll be uh, It'll start off going and start streaming to eventually a finite length, but you don't know how long it's going to be, but you can rewind it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so drawbacks. Yeah, it's not entirely live despite its name. There is a lag, and it depends on the size of your segments. Like Obviously, you can't actually give someone that segment until you've uploaded it. So we're using 30 seconds at the moment, so the lag time tends to be about 50 to 60 seconds before someone sees it, which isn't ideal, but it's okay. Um, 
And you've got to transcode. You've got to do a lot of redundant work. You've got to transcode to every desired bit rate and codec you want, even if no one's going to use it. Um, and transcoding individual segments so that you avoid audio artifacts at the join of the audio segments, that's tricky. And there's still a single point of failure, which is the, um, the segmenter. You know, something's originally got to listen to that stream and chop it up. And if that thing goes down, then you have no input to your system. So making that highly available, that's tricky. Everything's tricky. But for us, like, the things that we need to do is actually get some reporting and billing tools in there so we can actually bill people. Um, we want to create like, HTML5 players for stations. I've got the PBS and Dial app. That, with the Dial app is the Community Broadcasting Association's app, which is fairly simple. But after we do this kind of stuff, it's going to have the ability to be able to browse things like episodes, play previous episodes on demand, and all that kind of stuff. There's potentially commercial possibilities. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure people could benefit from some of this stuff that we're doing here. We're just going to work out how and whether they want to pay for it. Um, so we, we are storing, obviously, all the audio in there, but we're also collecting a lot of metadata as well, such as um, stuff people are mentioning on social networks. We're doing a kind of Shazam-style audio fingerprinting thing and trying to work out what's playing at what time on different audio streams. And so we're indexing all that stuff. We don't know what to do with it yet, but it's kind of nice to play around with it. And Elasticsearch is awesome. Um, potentially, we can do video streaming as well. There's no reason why we can do that. It's just a different FFmpeg command line. And we're going to play around with Raspberry Pi so we can actually deploy hardware into the studios and get a tap straight off of the sound desk so we get the best quality audio and encode it exactly how we want. But we do need help. If anyone fancies volunteering, helping us doing stuff, that would be great. And if anyone has any knowledge about FFmpeg and LibFDK and all these kind of crazy MPEG transport streams, I'd really like to pick your brains. <laughs> and we're also looking into investment and funding. So, you know, I don't know how this is going to work. There is, like, federal funds available for this kind of thing. So we'll, we're going to look into that. Questions? So uh, there is a strategy for it. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's, if your segment size is 30 seconds, it's probably about half that. I can't remember, but it's some function of the length of your segment. And uh, would, would HTTP, uh, long polling work? Or updates? Uh, no, no, because they're just static files. So you're not, you're not waiting. For, yeah. So there's no, non, there's no blocking operations on the socket here. You're just polling, requesting it, you know. There's no smarts on the server side. Do you worry about the uh, volume of storage you take over this three? Do you delete it as you go, or do you store it with your um, <coughs> Ultimately, it's going to get translated into a cost to the client, the stations. So they will be able to determine. We haven't built the thing that deletes it yet, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, store for prosperity. <laughs> it would be nice to get to a point where we can just keep stuff indefinitely, but it's obviously probably not going to be viable. So. Yeah, we'll just charge it on. Bigger stations will be able to afford to keep it for longer. If, so. it's, a, if it's public radio, and then things like the Internet Archive will store it for nothing. Yeah, like it's, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So Especially if it's just HTTP, right? So you know, it's easy, they can just cache it. Yeah. How much latency does it have between a live broadcast and actually being transmitted? Yeah, about 50 or 60 seconds at the moment. And you can reduce that by reducing the segment size and also reducing the other overhead. So like the rate at which we poll for new segments and the rate at which the thing uploads it, you know, if we could tune all that stuff, we get it down. What do you use your Redis server? Yeah, Redis database for? Uh, Rescue. So Rescue is a, a Ruby uh, worker pool um, system that GitHub built. It's kind of, it's pretty simple. I quite like their tagline, which is, we assume chaos. So that you don't want to build something where something crashes or seg faults and it's going to take out everything else. So this is all about process isolation. You know, something can go horribly wrong in one particular process, but all the other ones are fine. Yeah. But it's, it's pretty cool. It works for what we need to do. You're using a CDN, or does S3 provide that for you? We, we have um, CloudFront in front of the CDN, um, although we're not really using it at the moment, but that would be a pretty 
cost-effective way of making, like pushing stuff off of S3, you know, so. If you reduce the latency, what sort of effects does that have on battery life on the clients? Hmm, good question. I don't know. <laughs> well, Apple actually recommend 10 seconds as a optimal segment size, but I think that's because they're normally talking about video. So obviously the file size would be larger. And I think we can get away with 30 seconds for audio. But it really comes down to a function of how much are people willing to put up with in terms of latency. So, is there added latency of going from S3 to CloudFront? How long does it take to go from S3 to CloudFront? Yeah. So if it, yeah, if there's a cache miss in CloudFront, it passes back, and it, I guess it would be slightly longer, but it's not that much. You know, CloudFront's really good if you're getting a lot of hits in lots of geographical locations. So it pulls stuff. So it doesn't matter whether S3 is set up in Sydney or wherever it is, you know, it, all the content's dragged to the edge. But at the moment, since most of our consumers are in Australia, uh, it's not really giving us that much at the moment. But it's an option, you know, you just, that's the great thing, it's just HTTP, so there's no additional smarts, you just put it there when you need it, so. How do you ensure there's no, like, audio blip on the How, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's tricky. It's, it's supposed to just work. Um, the way I understand it is that when you do lossy encoding, there's always going to be gaps because they have to pad it to encode it. So Apple store the offset, i.e. The, how big that gap is. And so when it plays back, they can just munge it so it works perfectly. But I'm having problems with that. So <laughs> hence the call for help. Yeah. Um, legally, um, well, we're not. We're, we're doing it on the station's behalf. So, if you go to like the PBS's website and that sort of thing, it, that's using our stuff. Um, we're yeah. So we're just like we're just like a broadcast platform. So we're like FM or digital radio. We're just the other thing. You know, audio goes in this end. Internet's out here. So we're not, yeah, you know, we're not misrepresenting and saying it's our own content or anything like that. Yeah. How do you see this fitting with uh, like callback radio? Uh, in terms of its lag time. The 50, 60 Yeah. Yeah, it's not ideal. On different stations prefer less lag and other stations don't care as much. I think it's just going to. have like a lag time anyway, so if you swear or something, they can flip it out. Some do, yeah. But I think. Triple, triple J gets broadcast from Sydney and they have people calling from Perth, so there's a, there's a two hour delay for you, so there's a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, we can tune that, that's, that's easily changed, and it's just a matter of finding a balance between, obviously if we make it, say, 10 second lag time, that's going to increase our overhead of processing lots and lot, like, basically three times as many segments. Yeah, so. Radio station records it's when that leaves the radio station yep. with the square web filters. Right, okay. And then there's your process and we on top of that. Yep. So, yeah. 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 It's okay. It's cost effective, so they'll love it. But they might you might be able to get in front of the censorship because you're not seeing enough public broadcast, so you can get in front of the censorship and you get you be ahead of the <laughs> <laughs> Um like there's been internet radio things, I mean Icecast. I remember Icecast in the 90s, you know, like, um, and you've still got a lot of that style of yeah. internet radio. Um, it appears to be that most of the scaling happens for that sort of stuff at the ISP side of things, like pushing like Icecast edge servers out to the ISPs. What, yeah, you can... What do you can... The, the, your way versus what has been working, right, well, working-ish for decades? So Icecast will depend on you having proxies or something there which can support that kind of long-term, like keep alive style HTTP connection where you're opening it up and just data keeps coming down. But obviously that means there's open sockets everywhere. So on, ultimately when it comes back to your central server, you've got to have something which can cope with having that many open connections and you've got to be able to, something's got to be able to scale out to serve that kind of stuff. So. This for us is good because we don't have to solve that problem. Amazon solved that problem. Yeah, I mean, well, Icecast can 
do things like multicast IP, so yep. you don't need all those open connections because you can have like a central broadcast point is multicast to get to the edge mm. servers, and then those edge servers of the ISPs are, are dealing with those individual connections. But then you can't. The trouble is with that is that's great for live broadcast, but you can't do say. You can't use the same system to do replay or pause and all that kind of stuff. There's, and one of the big problems is that on iOS, if you load up a progressive download, which is affected, Shoutcast progressive downloads the same kind of thing, you know, it will just aggressively download it as fast as the server gives it to it, which means that you can churn through hundreds of megs on LTE in no time at all. And that's how I managed to get a very, very large phone bill the first time I was testing this. So HLS rate limits it, but the client's got the smarts to be able to choose how quickly it downloads stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily one size fits all, but it's, it's good because you, can, you don't have to tunnel through other stuff. You don't have to have all these edge servers and multicast setups. Yeah, it's been for sure in a more disconnected environment like uh, mobiles, mm. where you might be jumping from AT, APN to APN, or you know, you can because it's an individual connection or potentially an individual connection or restartable. Yeah. You, you're not tied to that one night you were on. Or, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm very aware that we've run out of beer, so. <laughs> <laughs>